Today I'm very happy to have with us Tom Dowd, uh, a noted record producer. We are very fortunate to have a person of Tom's caliber and experience in the South Florida creative community. Today we're going to explore Tom's six decades in the recording industry. And uh, Tom, I'd like to start by ask, uh, starting at the 1940 uh, uh, beginning uh, of that decade period. Uh, I see from the research I've done that uh, you didn't really start out in the music industry. You came by it in a, a different way. Could you tell us a little about that, please? Yeah. How my first experience in the recording industry was a holiday after having returned to college coming out of uh, World War II. I had spent uh, four and a half years working for the Office of Scientific Research and Development that included almost three years in the military. Um, and when I went back to school, I figured I was going to be able to get some credit for the things that I had done while I was working, doing what I was doing. And because of uh, restrictions to do with secrecy and privacy and uh, national defense and so forth and so on, I was going to have to go back to college and take physics and chemistry all over again. And you know what? I said, I need a break. <laughs> So I went to work in a demo studio in New York City, a publishing house, Carl Fisher, the people who published Puccini and Mozart and so forth. And they had a little demo studio. And I went down there to work one summer, uh, picking up an ad in the New York Times. And uh, this was in June of 1947. You would never know that on the horizon there was a musician strike taking place. And all of a sudden, any place that had a microphone and a turntable was a recording studio, and I got sucked into the recording business. <laughs> and you've never been the same since, right? <laughs> I, uh, I'm glad if, if I had gone into a career, into the science career approach, or if I had gone into banking or something else, I'd have been retired and be dead by now, I'll be <laughs> honest with you. I'm having too much fun. Well, that, that's true. The, the music industry certainly has a way to keep you vitalized and keep you looking to the future. Uh, also, uh, in this uh, 1940s period of your uh, career development, uh, I noticed that you worked for a large number of, of labels, record labels, and uh, as I understand from talking to you earlier, uh, these uh, recordings, most of, of them were directed disc. discs. There was no tape involved at this point yet, is that no, correct? No, tapes had not been, uh, tape machines were not introduced to the recording studio uh, until about the late 1948, no, October, November 48, the beginning of 49. Everything else was directed to disc. So that uh, you had an enormous responsibility when you sat behind a control board. You, that's it's a long story. Uh, the radio engineers became recording engineers because they used to do all the big bands in the ballrooms and so forth, and they'd put up mm -hmm. one microphone for the band and one microphone for the singer announcer, and then they'd sit there and go to sleep for 15 minutes while the band played. But if you tried to make records that way, it, uh, the, I didn't think that that was the right way to make records, so I started putting a mic on a drum, a mic here, a mic there, a mic there, and all of a sudden a unique sound People saying, where did you do that? How did you do that? And at the, we were drawing flies, you know what I'm saying? It was ridiculous. But everything was direct to disc. And you had to know what the parameters were that you, you couldn't play back the disc that you made. So you'd cut two discs, one that was virgin, and the other one you'd play back to see if there were no mistakes, if you were sure that was the one that was good enough. Hmm. And, and the rest of them you'd scrap. They were outtakes, they're gone. I mean, and that was it. And if the record skipped, the engineer could have his head handed to him. That's all I can tell you. And you were responsible for any kind of glitch of that nature, you I assume. You know it, a click, a tick, a pop, or the record skipping, or and you were in trouble. Uh, going back to these uh, labels such as Abbey, Columbia, Continental, Dial, Harmonia, and these, uh, and I noticed a very interesting one here, sitting in with Spiro, I assume that's a, a label. Uh, can you tell us uh, what marketing uh, strategies they were aimed at? All right, sitting in with was a jazz label. Oh, sitting in like the con like you would have a jam session. Hey, what were we doing last night, man? Oh, I was sitting in with so and so, or I sat there, but right. sitting in was that kind of experience where the the man who owned sitting in, Bobby Shad, started making blues and jazz records where he'd put blues musicians with jazz guys, jazz guys with blues, and they'd say, Hey, man, you know that song? How's that going? Poop, and he'd record them, you know, hmm. or they 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 narrow it down so that it wasn't more than two and a half or three minutes long, and. It, make a record of it. And, 
Spiro was a, was a Greek label, was an ethnic label, like Harmonia was a polka label. There were, there were a whole pile of little labels in the metropolitan New York area that catered to the people who had migrated to the United States just before World War II or had come right after World War II and were not affluent in our music or didn't like it but fancied the old things. So you had Greek records, you had Polish records, you had Russian records, you had Italian records. It's it's bizarre. Did these uh, labels get airplay in the New York area then, or how, how did people find out about this music? Um, there were small markets in a number of cities in the United States. Uh, if you went into the Detroit area, you had a heavy Eastern market, Egyptian, uh, Indian, uh, Indian rag type music. Uh, if you went up and down the East Coast, or if you went in of the United States, or if you went into the north central of the United States, you had polka bands all over the place. I mean, Frank Yankovic was all over the place on the East Coast, but nobody knew who Lawrence Welk was until he made a video. But th there were polka bands. So each one of these musics catered to a certain market, and there were little ores or uh, little veins of that market throughout the United States.